Uh, we finished last week, uh, we, we finished on talking about testing and knowing, right? And uh, we ended with test the spirits to see if they are of God. And also, the, Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. And we saw that test comes from uh, dokimazo, which really implies to discern, to examine. And you need to test means I need you to prove if what you're listening to, if what you're receiving uh, is uh, doctrinally sound. Is it true or is it false? Uh, to know, you'll know uh, the person or the guest speaker or the, the, the person that apparently is being used by God, okay? Uh, you're going to know them by their fruit. And so we looked at the new word of epinegasco, and uh, I, I further investigate. And when you look at epinegasco, it, it's, it's a compound. We start with epi. Epi means to be on top, upon, okay? You're, you're upon, that's the epi. And when you connect it with ganasco, okay, nagasco, sorry, nagasco, which means to know. So we see that um, when, when it says upon, it's used here to intensify the force of the following verb, nagasco, to know. So it's, it's, it's a command that you are to know the fruit, to know the acts, the deeds, the works in the other life. Uh, we looked at some of the definition of epinegasco, it means to fully know, to know fully, uh, to know with certainty, uh, to become thoroughly acquainted with, to become acquainted. You know, some of us say we have friends, but others are constituents, some are acquaintance, acquaintances, right? So there's different levels of intimacy, okay? The, the very close, intimate friends, those are the ones you share secrets with, right? but then you're not gonna share some intimate stuff with an acquaintance, okay? But, but here, Epinegasco uh, gives the impression of you, you wanna become truly acquainted, uh, recognize, you recognize uh, by sight, by hearing, uh, and also perceive who a person is. So a tree is known by its fruit. So when I am literally knowing Epinegasco, I am perceiving the tree to see who they are. So um, uh, basically to have one's character discerned and acknowledged. So when we're talking about the, the uh, tree is known by its fruit, I am going to be looking at uh, their character. I'm going to examine, I'm going to begin to scrutinize uh, their works, their deeds, their acts, okay? Because you can be up here and look holy, but then show me how you know how to serve somebody when you're out of the pulpit. Because there's a lot of people up in the pulpits and people with titles, but they don't like to serve, but they don't like to do the menial work. They don't know how to associate with the brokenhearted and, and, and the, the, the orphaned, uh, you know, person that's orphaned. They don't know how to deal with them. And so here we, we need to begin to examine. There is a responsibility that has been placed upon every believer. Jesus Christ already, when he died on the cross of Calvary, he said, it is finished. What's finished? Well, it's finished that I took a hold, the keys of death, and I took away the authority that the enemy had stolen from Adam and Eve in the garden. I've taken that, and now I've resurrected. And now, basically, you're an overcomer because what? I've overcame. But you have to do the work to enforce what I've already defeated. A police officer is only as good as the authority that he represents and the authority that backs him up. But if he doesn't enforce the law, then what good is his authority? So each and every one of us has a responsibility to test and then to begin to really examine, discern, perceive, and know. Get acquainted with those that are, you're receiving from, okay? Not only in this case, but also in your churches, in your, with your leaders or with, with, with anyone, okay? You get to do what? To uh, measure the character, you discern it, you acknowledge it, to examine what, is, what are the acts, you know, the spiritual fruit. What is the act? What is the deed? Uh, what are the works? So uh, we want to test and prove uh, what anyone is saying and what are they doing, right? Because it's not about just talk to me. I want to see an example. I want to see a life that's submitted and surrendered. Because if you talk to me that you love God, but you're not submitted and surrendered, that word falls to the ground. Because I'm not looking. And we have a generation today that wants evidence. We have a generation today is show me. Not show me the money, you know, but show me. 
okay? Uh, and so Jesus led by example and what he spoke, but you could see it in his lifestyle. And so we want, when we're examining and testing and proving, we wanna watch at what is being said. We wanna watch, okay? Uh, does it coincide with sound doctrine? But we also want to examine, we want to discern the life to see what types of works, deeds, and acts. Uh, and if those confirm and support what is that, that they're speaking doctrinally, if their life coincides with it as well, what they're teaching, what they're preaching, what's their philosophy, right? So you wanna see, okay, you're talking, you're preaching, you're prophesizing, but let me look at your fruit. That's our job. And so uh, we must inspect both. We must inspect uh, what is being said, but we must inspect the vessel that it's coming from. Why is that so important? Why is that so important? God bless you, Claudia. Why do you think that's important? Not all at once, please. <laughs> Ask the question. Why is it important that we test what is being spoken and we examine uh, the life that is bringing what is being spoken. We don't want to get misled, Rose. Because if we're following the wrong person, like you said, we won't make it to heaven. Okay, if we're following the wrong person, we will make it to heaven. Why else, um, uh, Celeste? Um, because that knowing you can't be yourself. Without knowing, you can become a hypocrite yourself. Ouch! I'm gonna do like Dan. With E.T. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> Why else? Adam. If you receive a teaching or a demonstration from somebody else that's not um, the sound doctrine that it should be, and you agree with it, you could then try and mislead others yes. by mm -hmm. um, with giving them that teaching and that um, behavior, those characteristics that you receive. So basically, because I can also be a follower and begin to teach and begin to live like that person who's I'm teaching, what I'm receiving that teaching from is what you're saying, yeah. right? Okay, all right. Well, you're damaging yourself and then damaging other people. So you're damaging yourself and you're damaging other people. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else? Nobody wants to give a try? <laughs> Oh, come on, guys. Why must I inspect what is being said to me? First of all, I need to make sure that I got to use, remember the plumb line? Come on, guys. What does that represent? Okay, so I should be very familiar with the plumb line and use that to gauge uh, and do like the barians is what I'm receiving from the front. Mm -hmm. Is it doctrinally correct? But then I don't stop there. In order for me to come into agreement with whatever someone else is imparting into my life. Because whether you believe it or not, when someone gets up here to teach you, to, to uh, preach, to, to prophesy, you basically they are imparting from their spirit to your spirit. There's always a spiritual implication. That's why you gotta be careful who's coming to teach and preach. Because you bring a preacher, let's say you bring an evangelist, because there's a dime a dozen evangelists, bring it to the church to evangelize. And if the shepherd doesn't do his due diligence and is not spiritually aware of what he's bringing, he can bring someone who's in rebellion, someone who's in lawlessness, someone who's not living, but puts up an appearance. So then he begins to teach or he begins to preach out to the people. And guess what you're receiving from him? You're receiving from his spirit. And then you wonder why you're having challenges to align yourself to God because somehow you've come into agreement. Why? Because you haven't done your job to examine what's been received and to examine the fruit in order then to come into agreement and say, okay, amen. Let it be so. Yes and amen. I take it. I come into agreement with it. So there's always more than just I'm receiving a word. There's always a spiritual implication. You're being receiving, you're recipients of a spiritual impartation. That is why the person that is up here teaching or preaching should be living a life of holiness, should be living a life submitted to God, of righteousness, surrendered completely. So Holy Spirit has an opportunity to use us as a channel to then from our spirit, what we have allowed the word of God to cut into us, to cleanse us and sanctify us. Then from that position, we're able to minister 
with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So when you guys get imparted, you're getting imparted also what's been given to me in my spirits. So we have to be paying attention. What are we receiving? But we're so laid back. And I don't know if it's because of the atmosphere that is just, we've just come to, uh, you know, it's rote. It's just a tradition. This is just what we do. We sit here and we just receive. We need to begin to serve God with our minds. We need to begin to examine what is being brought from the altar. What is being taught? What is being said? Is it doctrinally aligning with God's word? We got to use that plumb line. We got to have then that word in us. We got to have an awareness of the word of God. We have to have an understanding, not just, okay, well, I'm going to go home and check to see if the, no, it should be in you. You should have a love for the word of God. You, every believer that says I am a Christian and says I'm a God believer and a God follower, then we must also have a lifestyle that the word of God has to be in us because Jesus is what? The word. But I don't just satisfy myself with just examining the word. But the Bible says you need to know them by their fruit. So even though that their theology might be correct, I need you to check the fruit. There's another safeguard. When you're driving in a car, you have to, if you buy a car, you got to maintain it. You, you got to make sure the oil, the air um, is right on the tires. You, you, you know, make sure if it starts trembling on you when you stop, you know already it needs a tune up. But if, but if you don't do what you have to do to safeguard that car, what happens to the car? Engine light comes out. Engine light comes out. What else happens? It won't, turn on. it won't turn on. When you're ready to go to work, when you're running late, then all of a sudden, because you haven't do your due diligence. And that's the same thing in our spiritual life. So we must inspect both the teaching, but then we have to examine the fruit in the life of the believer of the leader, of the pastor, of the ministry. When we are associating with like-minded believers and we, we grow in communication and, and we begin to fellowship and we're talking and something lands on your lap from someone else, it's time for you to listen in, examine what's being said, go to scripture, know what scripture says, and then monitor the fruits. Because you can be coming good friends and associating with somebody that's a sheep in wolf's clothing and you don't know it because you're not doing your due diligence. Someone that came in, let me tell you what, the enemy puts plants. He puts friends by you that seem to be Christian, but they're really a plant there to get you sidetracked and get you out of where God has planted you. But whose job is it to inspect? Whose job is it to inspect the teaching and the fruit? Whose job is it? That's right, our own. Is it my job to do your job? Nope. It's each and every one has to have that responsibility. So to do this, yes, ma'am. First Corinthians 10, 23 says, all things are lawful, but not all things are prophecy. All things are lawful, but not all things are prophecy. Say that again, first. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 33. 23. 23. So we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse uh, 23. Okay? Go ahead. Read all again. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So according to 1 Corinthians, I'm going to do like Dan. 1 Corinthians. <laughs> I love my husband. God bless him. Chapter 10, verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. So there are things out there that you can be you have access to or, or you can engage with. But the Bible says that they're not helpful and they don't edify. So be aware. Again, you see how the word just, it doesn't contradict. It gives you, it gives you hints, points on how to set those safeguards. So just like uh, uh, Prophet Betsy back there, amen, we declared in the name of Jesus, okay? <laughs> All right, uh, gave us 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. So again, we have, to have, we have to have daily exposure and practice with heaven's plumb line, with heaven's plumb line. We got to learn how to use the plumb line. And his plumb line, again, is his word. And it's the only standard that we use to measure if a thing or a person is what? Authentic and genuine or if it's counterfeit and false. Did you guys get that? 
So we got to use the plumb line, which is his word. And it should be the only measurement, right? The only tool that we use to be able to measure something or a person to see if it is authentic and genuine or if it's a counterfeit and it's false. Remember? Um, so, so his word. Okay. And you know what I'm recording. So you can go back to the lesson. Okay. And get back, get this. I'll put it on band, but just, it's the standard. God's word is the standard that we use to measure whether it be a thing or a person, uh, to see if it is authentic and genuine or if it's counterfeit or false, because remember a few weeks ago that I shared with you, if you looked at Ephesians chapter four, verse 11, you see that there is a fivefold ministry that God has ordained, that God has established. Well, guess who also has a fivefold ministry? Yep, you got it. Satan has his own counterfeit system. And so we have, the, you have to understand that if the fivefold ministry uh, that God has established, the fact that there's a false one, you know there's a true one. Because anything that, um, you know, I think that Satan playing with God, I rebuke him in the name of Jesus, but I think Satan plays with God that game that anything you can do, I could do better. So he's created a false system that looks and smells and he, it just, it, it talks and, and it looks like God, but it's not God, it's counterfeit. So you use the plumb line to use as a measure to determine if something is genuine, authentic, or if it's counterfeit and false. So remember that anything that God does, Satan attempts to what? To invade, distort, copy, twist, pervert, and that's his nature. You have to understand your enemy. There's a book um, that I was given when I graduated uh, um, college, and it's uh, uh, The Art of War, okay? And it's a really interesting book because it talks about warfare, not so much physically, but it talks about warfare of the mind, how you do things. And so one of the things they talked about is you got to know your enemy. You got to know who your enemy is. You got to know the tools and the devices and the schemes, what he uses so that what you're not taking advantage of. So again, he gives, uh, the enemy makes a counterfeit system. He's got a counterfeit a five-fold ministry, because as we've been talking from the get-go of spiritual deception, we have seen through scripture that there is a false apostle, a false prophet. We have a false evangelist, false shepherd, and a false teacher. There's even false brethren. Ah! Mm -hmm. They come and they sit by you, and they talk tongues, and they raise their hands, and they jump up and down. Mm -hmm. Yep, and they're sitting right there, but they're witches. Mm -hmm. And warlocks, because they sit there and they gossip and they, they speak words of cursing against the leaders. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. many people think, no, witches? No, the only thing I learned about witches, they wear this big hat and they got green noses with a ward on it. No, there's witches in church, charismatic witches that sit within the body of Christ that are plantings of the evil one to be there to bring witchcraft within the atmosphere. Haven't you been in a service and you're like, man, it's so like, What's going on that is so heavy? The, there's so much. That's because there's stuff moving within the atmosphere. Unless you're not, you're not in alignment with the spirit, you're not going to even know. You're falling asleep because I've seen people fall asleep in benches. They sit there and they just fall asleep. I'm like, oh, Señor, que prenda ese diablo de, de sueño. Lord, rebuke that devil of sleep that comes to Lala. The people are asleep in a, in a lullaby and they can't even receive the word of God. And then they wonder why they can't walk circumstances before the presence of God. They're all, they're all got problems or, or challenges because why? They're not receiving that word. They can't hear. They're asleep. Okay? So again, we have to understand that the enemy has built a system of false uh, fivefold ministries, even uh, false brethren. And so we see that most of these uh, false ministers, they will merchandise the anointing. They will merchandise the anointing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, when you got those uh, false prophets, we ain't got no false prophet here. I just want to say, okay, we got thank you, Jesus, for our true prophets. Because I've seen some false prophets, let me tell you what. And they've come up to me and said, God brought me here to you. They've, God brought me here to help you, to support you, to be your right man. Really? Hmm. Time will tell. And I love it when God gets involved because he exposes. Everything that's hidden will always come out to the light. Let me tell you what our sin, the Bible says, will find us out. 
You can hide, baby, hide and run. But sooner or later, what's hidden always comes out to the light. And thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you for the spirit of revelation. Hallelujah. So anyways, let me keep going because I go somewhere else. So, uh, so anyways, so they merchandise the anointing. And so oftentimes they'll exploit the children of God. Uh, they gain access into their lives because why? Uh, I want you to understand that we are at risk. Listen well. Not so much those that are distracted or those that are kind of like gone off the way. No, even the believers who are hungry for God and hungry for the moves of God are at risk for being deceived. And so these, these false representatives come in and, and they see that in a life and they take advantage of it. And they come to fleece the sheep and really they don't care about you. But the fact that you're so gullible or the fact that you are so hungry for God, the fact that you don't have knowledge or they have a big title all weighs in. And if you're not careful, they take advantage of the sheep. And we see that happening way too often. And so when we're hungry for God, when we're hungry for the moves of God, how many here are hungry for God? Amen. Yeah, we want to be hungry for God. Do you understand that when you're hungry for God, when you really are seeking, when all of a sudden, I don't know, have you, have you experienced, oh, thank you, look, they're here. Have you experienced um, where all of a sudden you just say, like, I want more of the word. Like, I want to pray more. Like, I just, like, God is in my mind, even when I'm washing dishes. Like, I start singing hallelujah songs in the morning. Like, what's going on with me? And these are all signs that the Holy Spirit is active in your life. Come on now. Come on now. Holy Spirit, what you doing with me? Huh? All of a sudden, he's, alive, he's making me alive. And so all of a sudden, there's this passion. And I'm like, I, I just, I got to make it on Monday. I got to make it. So I can't make it on Wednesday, but I'm going to go on Zoom. You know, uh, I, I just, I want more of God. That hungry is a sign the Holy Spirit is active in your life. But if we're not careful, if we're not careful, also it's a risk for deception. It's a risk. It's a, so, so we got to be careful, okay? Uh, it can uh, cause us to wrongly abandon reason, wrongly abandon sound doctrine, and wrongly abandon our own common sense. So... When that happens, we grab a hold of anything that begins to move and look like God and, and signs and wonders and miracles. And what? That ministry over there? The power of God is over there? I want to be a part of that. And then, wait, what's going on? This is dysfunction. This is not. What? Over there, the prophet is moving? What? He's uttering and he's speaking to you and blessings? Oh, I want to go over there because I'm hungry. And we begin, if we're not careful, we start following prophets. Who's prophet? What so-and-so is coming to what church? I'm going to be right there. I don't care if I have to drive two hours. I'm going to be over there. Because why? We're hungry, but that hunger can, if we're not, if we don't, if we're not aligned to the plumb line, and we're not really asking Holy Spirit, we can what? Um, not even, we, we don't reason. We're not thinking. We're moved by our impulses. We're moved because of that hunger, and that hunger has to be unchecked. We always have to go back to the plumb line. We always have to talk to the Holy Spirit and ask. If he, you don't got no clearance, don't move. If he hasn't given you a yes, don't go. Because you expose yourself. All right? And so we see the mark of the supernatural uh, on different things. But just because you see miracle signs and wonders, you have to ask yourself, what origin is that coming from? Because let me tell you what, the devil also does great wonders. The devil also has miracle signs and wonders. When we look at the book of, Mos um, the book of uh, Exodus and we see Moses went up to Pharaoh and there's Pharaoh's warlocks. And here the Lord told Moses, I want you to throw the rod down and, and it's going to turn into a snake. And just as he did that, what did those magician do? They did the same works. Oh, I can only imagine Moses. Because he was like taken back. He's like, oh, Lord, you got me into a good one. What am I supposed to do here? Because nowadays, if we don't have God in our life and the word of God in us and Holy Spirit leading us, we see that same thing working and we're like, oh, glory be to God. God is using you so mightily. And that, that's not even God. It's coming from a position of demonic entity, it's the realm of darkness, because that also has power. Why do you think we live in a generation today that is so after and hungry of the occult, the new age? Because they're seeking power. Because that comes with power. But what they don't understand is that comes with a level of bondage and servitude. That comes with a level of consequence. That comes with a level where 
they get so involved and deeply involved with the occult that then the same demons that were entertaining them and they thought they had control of those demons are the same demons that come and give you whoop, a whoop, a whoop, a whoop, a whooping. Okay, and the rear end, excuse me, I was gonna, uh, I was gonna say something else. A whoop in the rear end, okay? Gives you a whoop in the rear end. I was trying to be careful with what I'm saying. Lord, don't let something come out that it's not supposed to, but you get my drift. Uh, I was doing like that one, uh, hoo, hoo, hoo. <laughs> Y'all can laugh with me, that's okay, that's all right. But these devils come and they'll torment you. And you live a life of torment and why of our psych hospitals are filled with people that are tormented because they've messed with stuff, open Ouija boards, dungeons and dragons, getting in things that, why? Because I want power. I want to experience something. And the churches that I go to have no power. The churches that I go to are so boring. The churches that I go to are hypocrites. They don't live what they preach. So it pushes everyone away and pushes them to the realm of darkness. So let me tell you what, the darkness also has power. Any questions here? Okay, everybody understanding so far? Yes, Adam. Um, okay, you kind of answered it, but just to be clear. So those false ministers that are part of the, um, the false Bible ministry, mm -hmm. they're aware that they're playing a role, right? That's a very good question. Um, I think someone asked, I think it was you, Misael, that asked one time, are they aware that they're doing this? So here's the answer that we gave Misael. So deception is insidious. The person that's being deceived doesn't know they're being deceived. Okay. They think they're right because oftentimes it's tied to pride. Everything is tied to, everything is tied to pride. Oh, pride. We need to evict her, kick her out in the name of Jesus hmm? or him, right? Pride, her or him based on your identity and gender. Kick it out, right? And so often, okay, so they're deceived. They think they're doing right, but they're really deceived, they're doing wrong. Another is they've probably received correction because we've got a lot of rogue, rogue, fivefold ministers who do whatever they wanna do and they don't submit to their pastor. And so they don't live right, but they wanna still do whatever they wanna do. They wanna keep doing their preaching and because they're so, often some of these uh, people, are already tapped into their charismatic gift. They're, they're, they're gifting, they know how to use it. And let me tell you what, you could still be in the wrong uh, and have access to your gift and the Holy Spirit doesn't take it away from you. He never, when he gives you something, you, you've kept it. But the thing is that sometimes they know, but they fail to submit. They don't wanna submit. Oftentimes they don't submit because it's lucrative. They've made it lucrative. They are selling, they're merchandising the, the, the giftings, they're using it, and they shouldn't, but they'll have to give account to God that day. So you have some that, that do, that are not aware, and so then you have some that are aware, they've been brought to the attention, but they've refused, they've rebelled, and they're out on their own, okay? And then you have those that are just wicked, and they know they just want to just fleece, they just, they, because they're after the money. Okay, so those three little options. Does that answer? Yeah, okay. Any other questions right now? Okay, so um, if y'all have another comment, if any of you have Me. a comment also on Zoom. Okay, there's a comment here. Go ahead, take your mic out so I can hear you, love. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I just wanted to say, with you saying about the new age, I feel like nowadays, like this new generation, um, those are like there's some that are hungry for the word but then those who don't know anything about god i feel like they are seeking power because they want to be right about everything and they block everything that they want to hear about god and religion they block it out because they want to have their own power and i feel like that's that's what it comes down to like nowadays and it's really really sad because i can't have a conversation with no one about god and it's really sad. Yeah. And, and, and let me add to that. Thank you so much, Vicki. Let me add to that, that the thing is that they become their own God. Mm -hmm. They've become their own God. So, so we live in a, um, that's called Generation Z, I think it is, right? Generation Z, this generation. Mm -hmm. And if we look at it, it's a very lawless generation. It's a generation that, if you look at, if you go to the um, Old Testament and you begin to look at the generations, you always find that by the fourth 
and the fifth generation, it gets corrupted. Okay, it's so corrupt because the word has not been, we're supposed to be teaching, we're supposed to be constantly giving the word to our children. And so, uh, you know, when we fail to do that, it marks the generation and then from there on. So by the time it trickles down to that fourth and that fifth generation, it is a very lawless generation. It is a generation that they, uh, the God is self. The God is their, they love their own opinion. That is all they follow. And so they reject and resist anything else uh, in this matter when you bring the word of God to them. So, and so for these types of, of gener this type of people, we've got to pray. We've got to, we've got to ask God and the Holy Spirit to minister unto them and break them, uh, bring them to a place of brokenness so that they could be tender in their hearts and they will be willing to receive. And oftentimes that's what it's going to take is that there would something would happen that they would recognize their need for uh, God. But thank you, Vicki. Thank you. Um, so again, remember that having a zeal for God is a good thing. Um, having a, a desire to see the supernatural move of God, that should be a part of our life. That's, 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 I don't know about you, but I'm a, I'm a spiritual person. And I was told through the word of the Lord that because I'm a spiritual person, I have access to the supernatural. So my life every day, my lifestyle, I should see the supernatural of God involved in everything that I do. Thank you for that. Amen. I should be walking always with the mindset of supernatural because the Holy Spirit is a supernatural uh, person that works on our behalf. And it doesn't say that I have the power to do whatever I want, no. But the fact that I am abiding, we just talked about that, I'm abiding with Abba. I have an intimate relationship with him. His word is in me. Uh, his spirit is in me. And so because I'm living right before him, because I'm seeking, I'm depending, I'm wholeheartedly, I've exposed every area of my life to him. I've literally surrendered completely to the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit comes and takes over. Now I'm like, go ahead, lead me. Take the wheel, Holy Spirit. And you know, and, and I'm not gonna tell you it's always honky dory because sometimes he's gonna push you in your faith. You, you, let me tell you why. If you think that this is easy and it looks easy, it's not. One day I had a person that tells me, I can do what you do. <laughs> I'm like, you can? Yeah, I can do, I can, that's easy. I've led this type of women and I've done this and this and that. I'm like, okay, you, you know, God bless you. She took a position. And she was going to open a brand new service, never showed up. And she, what? She surrendered that position. Because if you don't have the anointing of God and the backing of God to do this kind of job, this, you're not going to be able to do it. You can, you can, it'll be limited and you, you're going to have a hard time. But, but if God is not flowing through that and God hasn't ordained you, it's going to be one of those worst experiences that you're going to have. To, to be in a position, you better make sure that God has called you. You better make sure that God has anointed you. You better, you better have gone through the process of learning how to surrender fully and give, give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to do what he has to do because there's going to be time where he's going to require you to walk in faith. On Sunday, I had a battle. I sat here in this corner talking and fighting with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, fighting. Because mm -hmm. he's telling me to do something. I'm like, but you know, but no. And I'm opening my Bible. Talk to me. Let me see if you give me a confirming word. The Holy Spirit said, I gave you already what you needed to do. Do it. And it was hard for me. And I had to move in faith and obedience. Because there's times God's going to ask you to do something that you're not going to want to do. Yes, can I hear an amen? amen. There are some things that's just not going to go your way. And you got to get the attitude out. Because if you don't get that attitude out and you don't get yourself adjusted and aligned with heaven, you're not going to see the supernatural power of God working in your life or in your loved ones or whatever situation that you're asking him to show himself. So you're going to have to obey. But in order to obey, are you submitted, first of all? Let me look up so nobody thinks I'm, I'm talking to them. <laughs> You've got to be submitted. And I'm not saying half-hearted. I'm talking about your entire heart. Submission is that you take the position and the posture of humility, that you understand that you don't know it all, that you understand that you need to be led and taught, that you understand that there's areas of your life that need to be washed by the blood of Jesus. 
Submission is that you're willing to take on and allow the leadership of Jesus Christ, whom you call, whom you say that since I've gotten baptized, Jesus is now living in me and not me. Really? Show me your evidence. Submission is that I allow now Holy Spirit into every area of my life. And I allow him to tell me what I need to do. How high do you want me to jump, Holy Spirit? What color do you want it in, Holy Spirit? What word? When do you want me to say it? Well, how much word? Do I hold back? What do you want me to do? Do you want me to speak? When I speak, what do you want me to say? When I speak it, how? Well, what do you want me to? You know, every little thing should be guided and governed by the Holy Spirit. And when Holy Spirit literally guides you, that he will not leave you in shame. And you will have earned an experience once again with God, with the Holy Spirit, and your faith. Guess what it'll do? It'll be strengthened. Our faith, we've all been given a measure of faith, but our faith must grow. Say, my faith must grow. Faith must grow. So we must, it's important for us to have a zeal for God and, and wanting the supernatural. And so that has its positive and negative effects. Uh, and we have to know that the positive is bringing heaven down into earth and having heaven invade every area of our life. Wow. Woo. Come on now, people of God. Having heaven, an open portal. You know what? Jacob laid down, had a pillow as a rock. How many of you like to sleep on a, on a rock for a pillow? Oh no, give me the, my pillow. Give me the, my pillow. Cause I need comfort. Some of us have way too much comfort. And it's time for God and Holy Spirit to get in there and inconvenience you in the name of Jesus. Oh, I will prophesy that to you. That is my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will launch out to you and inconvenience you. Inconvenience you. Wake you up and begin to get you out of that comfort and familiar zone. You've been in there way too long. Take you out of there in the name of Jesus. Positive and negative effects. We want heaven to permeate every area of our life because we will see the power of God. I'm telling you because I live it. I live it. Those of you that know me and know that my, my, my story with my children. And one of the things I have been asking for is Lord reconcile my children with each other, with me, but most of all with you. I don't know what your prayers are like, and I'm getting off the outline and that's okay. I don't know what you're praying for. I don't know what your need is, but I know that God can answer it. Amen. I know that God can meet that demand. You don't have to pay for nothing, but you do have to pray. You don't need nobody else to do it, but you to get into your closet and take some time to begin to encounter God in prayer. And I have been praying and it takes some time because there is a waiting period and we have to learn patience. Come on, say patience. patience. Now, you know, we all love patience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, no. We like immediate gratification. We want it now. Like the Burger King. I want it my way, baby. Now. This is a now generation. We have been indoctrinated by society, by this culture. To have everything, say now. now. None of you. Let me hear it again. Now. now. All right. And we think we can come to God and say, give it to me now. It doesn't work that way. Do you understand that when you begin to pray, start here. And when God answers, the in-between place, God is working with you. God is working out some things. He's working. He's changing. He's renewing. He's breaking. He's literally doing and forming you and somebody new so that when he answers, you can receive that answer and recognize that it has been only by God and not, oh, I did this. Oh, I did that. No. So in that season of waiting, God is doing a work. Amen. Amen. And some of us need a lot of work. Let me look up here. Are y'all receiving something in there? We need Holy Spirit in our lives daily. Right? Yeah. So that what? As we're praying, 
Prayer not only allows God to get access into what? Into what we're asking him to do. But let me tell you what, that prayer also changes us. And my son, the other day, I received a phone call from my son that God has got him so like this. And, and I know, understand why. And that gives me more encouragement to keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. Don't let go of your prayer. Because just when you're about to let go, God was like, don't let go because I'm ready to answer. Amen. The devil's like, get her, get her to stop praying. Get her to stop praying. Get her to stop praying. Because she's doing some damage in the spirit realm. She's messing with my stuff. She's breaking some things down because God is listening to her. And he sent a, a, a legion of angels to war on her behalf because she's praying for her family members. She's praying for her children. She's praying for her marriage. She's praying for her generations. So I got to do something to stop her from praying. Sometimes I was getting to the point where it's like, I don't see anything, Lord. And I would sob. I would swallow my tears because it gets tough to wait it out. But those that wait on the Lord, come on, there's a plumb line. But those that wait on the Lord shall renew what? Their strength. They shall be like what? And where do the eagles go? Where do they soar? Where do the eagles abide? Oh, Lord, help me. This they, Go eat some Wheaties. Go eat some chips or something. Isaac, where did the eagles fly? Huh? Where? Is it low sky or high sky? The highs. The, the, the eagles are in the high places. And that's where the Lord wants to bring us into. And my son called me the other day out of the blue. And we got a hold and we began to talk. And I about to swallow my own tongue. And I couldn't believe what he was telling me. And all I could see is God opening a way. God would take my son from Michigan and bring him right here, land him in my own home. Come on now. Yes. That's yeah. prayer. So I want to encourage you to be willing to invoke the name of God and allow the Holy Spirit open heavens upon your home, upon your life, so you can walk in the supernatural. Amen? Amen. So if we don't learn to put to practice what God is telling us in his word regarding testing and knowing, testing, dokimazo, knowing, epinagasco, then we will unfortunately accept and reach out to every new supernatural manifestation that comes along without what? Thinking, without reasoning, without, without questioning. Sometimes you got to question some stuff, okay? And it's okay. You do it in a respectful manner. It's okay. Some people teach you, you can't question because that's rebellion. No, no, I encourage you guys to please, by all means, if you see something, ask. Do it in a respectful way, but get some answers. And you need to prove. And if we don't do this, what we're going to find is we're going to be in the treadmill of always being deceived, always being deceived, always jumping from place to place to place and never allowing God to establish us. Why? Because we haven't learned to do what God is asking us to do, which is to test and to also uh, know the fruit. Okay? So there must be an urgent need for every believer to awaken. Say, awaken. Awaken. We have to awaken. As, as children of God, we must be led by the Spirit of God. And so we need to have our discernment awakened. Uh, we need to have sound thinking awakened. I'm not talking about the gift of, of discerning of spirits. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about basic discernment that comes from having a relationship with the Word of God and knowing how to use that plumb line to then discern individuals, to discern a thing, to discern atmospheres. You get to the point where Holy Spirit then begins to truly allow you to have that gift of discerning of spirits, and you see even more. And oftentimes, that's where you can pray. That's so you don't, you know. Anyway, so uh, how many know that Bible says that Satan disguises himself as what? As what? As an angel of light. As an angel of light. So not everything that shines is gold. Not everything that speaks in tongues and jumps up and down and praying over people and, you know, falling back and laughing and stuff is you need to, you need to examine what is that all about. And so just because a person or a ministry has signs, wonders, miracles, prophetic utterances doesn't validate that it is of God. I'm trying to teach you people of God. Will you let me, will you be open to this teaching? Would you receive it please in the name of Jesus? I'm equipping you people of God. 
I'm, I'm arming you up, people of God. This is not just a, another teaching. This is I'm arming you as men and women who would use that noggin that God has given you, that intellect, the reasoning, to use scripture to examine. Not a lot of people get this. Not a lot of, you know how they have to learn through hard mistakes. And then you find a lot of people talk about church hurt because they're not being taught. You have the privilege of being taught of what scripture is telling us what to do. So I have to test, I have to know if the origin is godly or if it's demonic. So I have to ask, I have to use the plumb line as a standard for all that I measure. And I also have to begin to talk more with the Holy Spirit. I gotta conversate, Holy Spirit, what is this about? Holy Spirit, why do I sense this? Holy Spirit, show me in your word. Holy, I don't know, but you should have a daily conversation with the Holy Spirit. I wanna encourage you guys to do that if you haven't been doing that. You don't know how to pray. Holy Spirit, you know what? I don't know how to pray. Can you teach me? Can you just, I don't know what to say. And you just start like that. Holy Spirit, I'm having a hard time grasping this. I, I, can you open my mind? Can you open the eyes of my understanding? Because I, I can't, I don't know. I've searched and searched and I can't get it. Can you just open me up so I can understand that? Would you please remove the blinders out of my eyes? Holy Spirit, this person's coming around and talking to me more often. And you know, is this from God? Because you know, the Bible says that when a man finds a good thing, he, you know, when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. So could it be, is this my knight in shining armor? Holy Spirit. Got to talk to him about everything. So I'm going to show you that spiritually mature believers, Betsy, find me Hebrews chapter five, verse 14. And Evelyn, find me it in the passion translation. Hebrews chapter 14. Five. No, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. What I want to talk to you guys is that spiritually mature believers. The question is, am I a spiritually mature believer? Just ask yourself that question. Don't look at nobody. Don't raise your hands. Just spiritually mature believers are those who have graduated into solid food. Solid food is that strong meal. It's the one that makes you uncomfortable. It's the one that's like, ooh, I'm having a hard time with this word. It's that, it's that meal that's a meaty and, and, and it's doctrinal. It's, it's theology. It's, 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 the nit, it's the nitty gritty of the word. And so you're no longer in drinking milk. You're in solid food. But, but also spiritually mature believers have learned to exercise their spiritual senses. The people of God today, you're being taught so you can learn how to exercise your spiritual senses. I'm giving you some key advice from scripture, how to what, how to exercise your spiritual senses. If you leave here and you do not practice what you learn, if you don't put it to practice, all you're basically saying is, I am not a mature believer. I am still a baby and I'm still sucking on, on the bottle. So let me hear, uh, Betsy, I know you have a different translation. So go ahead and read Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained. Okay, stop right there. Because of what? Because of practice. What is practice? The act of doing. Only once a day? No, you engage. The first time you do it, you engage in a behavior. The more you do it, it becomes a habit. It's habitual. Come on. So if it's habitual, it's a behavior that you don't even have to think about. You're just doing it and it's innate. So when you practice something, you're engaged in it and you become, it becomes a habit. Yes. It's a lifestyle. But in order for it to become a lifestyle, it's got to start where? You got to put your mind and tell your mind and tell yourself, guess what, self? We are going to practice the word of God. Amen? And we're going to do it daily. Keep reading. Uh, because the practice have their senses mm -hmm. trained to discern, to discern good and evil. So your senses. We're talking not just physically senses. Because you there's times where you want to discern something with your natural eye. But God says, I want to take you beyond that. That's why you need the power of Holy Spirit. And if you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit, we're going to do a service. After, after we've got some folks that are going to get baptized. And then we're going to get ready. We're going to get into some serious fasting and prayer. And, and, and we're going to do a line for those that want to get baptized by Holy Spirit fire. And we're going to put hands on them so they can be filled with the Holy Spirit, because you've got to begin to discern things with your spirit man. That's the senses we're talking about. Your spiritual man can sense. 
The five senses are what? You can see. What else? You can hear. What else? You can smell. What else? Touch. What else? You can taste. Well, you can do the same thing in a, in, with your spirit man. So you can use your five senses, spiritually speaking, to detect, to detect what is good or what is evil. What does uh, the Passion Translation say? The solitude is for the mature whose spiritual senses perceive. Okay, enemy. stop right there. Solid food is for who? Mature. Solid food is for who? Mature. Who around here is mature? Amen. Come on now. Okay, keep going. Whose spiritual senses perceive heavenly matters. Perceive is a term to speak spiritually. I'm able to perceive what is happening in the spirit realm. I'm able to see beyond the natural. I'm able to see beyond the smoke screen. I'm able to see beyond the facade and the appearance to see truly something even further. What's that last part? And they have been adequately trained by what they've experienced to emerge with understanding of the difference between what is truly excellent and what is evil and harmful. So they've been trained. We are all here to be trained, people of God. How many know that we have to be trained in this? Amen. We don't know the way. We need Holy Spirit to teach us. We need to have that imparted into us so we can have and behave in a way that have what? Understanding. We've got to have understanding of why we do things, how to do things, when to do things. We've got to have all of that under biblical understanding so that we live lives practicing what? Able to use our spiritual senses, able to grow and be spiritually mature by taking the word and applying it daily, daily, daily. That's how I gain um, discernment. Yes, mama. Say that, um, practice them versus discipline. Yes. So it's a discipline because sometimes, and then I, I'll just apply this to like when I, and this is just a, like an example, like when you exercise or when you're a runner or whatever, you first start to practice it, but then it becomes a discipline every single day that even if you're not motivated to do it, you're still disciplined to do it. And then, yeah. and, and you do it. Absolutely. So we're talking about here being disciplined, right? Ways that we learn, whether it be nutrition or exercise, that we learn a discipline. Yes. Um, Celeste. Oh, just practice, but I'll excel during the race. Mm. So <laughs> what I learned is, you know, you don't keep up with your reading every day, and that's like your practice. But you think you can, you're strong enough to still deal with your child, and it's just Ooh, gonna yeah. fail. Just like if you think you can slack off and training for a five mm -hmm. day, and then in race day, you're gonna be dead after first mile or not even there because you haven't had that endurance and had that real practice. Because how you practice is how you play. Come on now. Come on now. Very good. Very good. Very good. So I don't know if you guys heard it, but Celeste was saying, was talking about, um, gosh, I should have brought you up here so you can, uh, now i got to paraphrase. Come over here and tell them. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to let her repeat again, but she was talking about discipline for, because she's a runner, okay? And how practice is imperative. Keep going. Tell them. So I was saying that a lot of people, oh, here I can take a There you go, yes. Um, so a lot of people, when they practice, they slack off because they think that they can just do better during the game or during a race. And so then they slack off so much that during comes race day that they're not prepared and they're not ready to run that race and they're not strong and they don't have the endurance just wow. because they thought that they could make it just because of their own talent. And a lot of people, just because of their talent or their anointing, they don't think they have to practice that. Wow. They don't think that Ooh. they have to be strengthened. So then when it comes a big trial, they just completely just shut down and they walk away from God because they're more angry at themselves because they were very arrogant, almost, I would say. Mm -hmm. They're very arrogant and they're just... And depending on their own wisdom. Yeah, own so, and they've really realized where they failed, but they're, they have so much pride at that point that they're not willing to turn back right. to God. So right. that's just my thing from being a runner. Yeah. No, and that's yeah. exactly, we're talking about that today, remember? Yeah. We're talking about discipline. Thank you. Thank you, Celeste. Very, very good point. Very good point, uh, Maritza. So, you know, that's why practice is important. We practice every day. We practice every day. Say we practice every day. Practice every day. Because we don't want to be caught off guard. Okay? We practice every day. We practice every day. <laughs> so why? Because we need to be ready for the day of. 
Yeah. You need to be ready. I've, I've taught my leaders, start preparing your sermons, start preparing your Bible studies. You better be ready. I mean, I, they know, I, that's my expectation with you. Don't come the day that I pull you and tell you, get up here and you, I don't know. No, I will not accept that. Mm -mm. I'm, why? I'm training them to what? To practice, to be ready in season, out of season. Paul told Timothy that you've got to preach the gospel in season and out of season. In order to be able to do that, you've got to be disciplined, disciplined, self-control. That is a fruit of the spirit. We can be disciplined on some things, but are we disciplined in our prayer life? Are we disciplined in getting that word in us and us abiding in him? Come on now. Are we disciplined in our fasting? Are we disciplined in pursuing God and his righteousness? We cannot be imbalanced. We talked about that yesterday. Mm. There we go again with that word reconciliation. Popping up again. So we need to exercise our spiritual senses. Questions right now. Questions. Thoughts right now. Anybody over there? Is Abner listening? Any thoughts from Abner? <laughs> Hello. Any thoughts? You're good. Okay. All right. Everybody turn to 1 Timothy 4.1. Oh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. You had a question. No, I was just gonna. I apologize. I was sorry. Gonna say that same word. You need to be ready in season and out of season. Yes. That's All right. There you go. In season and out of season. Everybody, go to First Timothy four one. Are you guys getting something? Amen. I hope. If you don't get something, that's not my fault. Because there's a lot here to choose from. Okay. Amen. Glory be to God. We thank you, Lord. First Timothy chapter four verse one. We've We've, we've gone now all the way back to our outline at the very beginning. And this is what the Holy Spirit wanted me to really begin to, we're going to break this apart. We're going to take it apart. We need to. We need to. And if I don't finish today, we're going to finish on Wednesday. But we're going to get this done. And you're going to get out of here with some good understanding that you didn't get probably at the very beginning because we were passing by. But I love it when the Holy Spirit says, go visit that again. I mean, you know, it's like your parent, you said, I'm done cleaning. No, go back over there and clean that correctly. Right? Right? And so Holy Spirit, that's right. Holy Spirit did one of these. And he says, Grisel, go back to the beginning. Ah. So we go back, back to the, take heed that no one deceives you. Take heed that no one deceives you. And so how many of you understand that we live in a society where deception is easily accepted in practice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How about you guys on Zoom? That we live in a world that, yes, a society that deception is easily practiced and accepted, right? So why is deception so dangerous? Come on now, people, don't leave me hanging. Why is it so it's dangerous? Easy. It's easy. It's easy. It's easy. What do you mean by that? It's easy. Wait, you want to <laughs> It's easy not it's to easy. do something. It's easy not to do something. It's easy not to do something? Yeah. Okay. So in, in this case, if someone's asking you to do something and you don't want to do it, what do you do? Is that what you well, mean? What well, is something that you do like, but you know that's not right? Oh, something that you like, but you know it's not right. Yeah. Okay, okay. But I'm saying it's easy to do it because you're already used to it. So you're doing it because you're already used to it. So it's a habit, huh? Yeah. So are yeah. you saying that like some people are habitual liars? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he answered oh. the question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I appreciate it, Gio. Thank you. So, why is deception so dangerous? <laughs> so, we have here someone answered and said, You could believe in a false narrative and be easily led astray. Okay, Abner. I guess I'm thinking along the lines of what Paul said that that which I would do. I do not do, uh, kind of going along with the flesh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, uh, you go with the flesh. Okay. Um, deception. What is deception? First of all, 
Let's define that. What's deception, guys? What is it? Falsehood. Deception is falsehood. Yes, Adam. Oh, so partial truth covered with a lie. Okay, yes. Why would you use deception? To manipulate. To manipulate? Why else? To deceive. What else? Influence. Okay. It's a deterrent to what? Okay. All right. Give me an example. <laughs> Somebody help him. Misael, help him out. <laughs> Give him a calling card. Help him out. <laughs> While you guys are figuring this out, Celeste. An example of Oh, silver tongue, huh? Yeah, yeah. So uh, one of our members here said that like politics, especially now, you know, we're running for president. And so they speak, everybody speaks and tells you the promises and they have a silver tongue because they give you all of these things. But in reality, when they get the position, then they don't fulfill what they said that they would do. So they're basically deceiving, right? So that's a form of deception, okay? When you speak something, but you're really just speaking it, but you're really not gonna fulfill it. Be careful with the vows that we make to the Lord. Be, be careful because if you made a promise to the Lord, make sure that you fulfill it. Because if not, that brings you into trouble and, some, and a curse will follow you. Be honest with God. Be, be, if you're gonna say a vow, make sure that you, know, you fulfill it. You make a promise, fulfill it. That your yes be yes and your no be no. There's no in between. And if you are uh, uh, in a habit of lying and deceiving, I'm telling you right now, repent, confess, and let that go. Because if you continue to practice that lying, you're just like your father then. Your father becomes Satan because he is the father of lies. So we should not have a lifestyle of lying. Not even deceiving, such as Adam said, uh, partial truth. Let me tell you what, you bring the truth, whether it's going to hurt you, whether it's going to humble you, just bring it out. Because if you uh, give half a truth and leave some other stuff out, that's a lie. When you come and tell the truth, to be it all the truth and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. Because above all, I'm, I'm before the Father. And you'll be found out anyways, because if you're one of those habitual liars, sooner or later, you're going to get caught in your own lie. Question back there. No? Oh, I I'm sorry, <laughs> Marissa. I, I apologize. I found something on deception <laughs> here. Um, but um, what I was reading says um, we don't always know uh, who is telling the truth without some serious investigation of both sides. Um, and and uh, here's where many fail. Many simply do not exert enough effort in the investigation to discover. Um, that they may be actually falling for deception and they are easily deceived. For many, for many, all that they require of, of one who speaks the word of God to them is that he does it powerfully and persuasively. Unfortunately, many seekers know this and use the power of persuasive mm -hmm. words mm -hmm. to convince others they speak the truth, knowing that the majority mm -hmm. of the audience will never check their words against uh, the revealed word of God and to discover they have been deceived. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So again, um, we have to do our work. We have to do our due diligence. We need to test. We need to examine. Amen. Uh, real quick, um, did you want to say something to help uh, this fellow guy right here, uh, Misael? I'm not sure, but I, I was along this line. One of the happy things that I hope to do is that I hope the website. Oh, come over here so these guys can enjoy your testimony. Sorry, come over here. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm gonna bring him up here so you guys can hear him, okay? He's got testimony. 
Sorry, come on. Hablale ahí, quita tu máscara. God bless you. God bless you guys. Uh, just something that happened to me a couple of years ago. I was on the internet and I saw this website and everything seems legit. Oh. Everything seems fine. The security check, everything was fine. So I made the purchase and like five minutes later, I got a call from my bank and they're like, did you authorize a transaction in Vietnam? And I'm like, no. What? And then they call me again. Did you authorize a transaction in Hong Kong? And I'm like, no, I did not. So then I realized that my website was being used wow. to stole the credit card with everything seemed legit. Everything, security, everything was fine, which I realized that not because everything checks, you have to be careful. Come on now. What, what you do on the internet. And hey, when, they didn't steal your money, did they? No, they could. Okay, okay. Wow, from Hong Kong and Vietnam? Vietnam. Dang. Woo, thank you. So, so just because something says that it is and it looks legit, make sure you do your due diligence to really examine, amen, to test and to check the fruit. Um, so what I'm going to do, because it's already 825, I'm just going to give you a quick introduction. We're going to leave this then for, oh, yes, yes, question. No, Gris, I just want to share real quick uh, another, um, something that came to mind as far as deception. Mm -hmm. uh, the importance of being led by the Spirit, uh, because as we know, there's um, like a mirage. I mean, people in the desert, they think they see something. Right. Um, we know that with certain diseases, people could hear, you know, with the eardrums or whatnot, mm -hmm. you could hear a ringing, you could hear different things when yeah. they're either not there or whatnot but by being led by the spirit it's uh i guess it's the way to go because if we rely on the natural on the flesh once again there's always room for yes being, come on now there's always room for deception taking yeah. place yes yes absolutely so thank you so much and that is true we must be led by the Spirit of God. That's the only person that should be guiding us in, in everything that we do and using that plumb line because we, he will not steer us in the wrong direction. Um, and he, the Bible says that he will bring us into all louder. True. He'll bring us into all truth, okay? We can't trust ourselves. We can't trust our hearts because it's very wicked and deceitful above all. So we can't even, and sometimes the biggest enemy is not the devil, it's our own flesh. It's our own mind corrupted like a, a, a bad DVD up in here, a corrupted file that plays over and over again and it keeps tripping us. So you can't trust even your own flesh. You gotta trust the Holy Spirit. And if we are truly the children of God, we will be led by the Spirit of God. Um, I was going to say, too, uh, sometimes we're so desperate for, for something to happen. Like, let's just say, um, let's just say single people. Okay, we're just going to put that as an example. And we want, uh, let's just say a woman, and we just want a husband so bad. Uh, sometimes we want that so much. And I think about the word that Abner just uses, uh, mirage. Like, And we think we see that husband, but really it's the counterfeit and it's, it's really not there, but we want it so bad that we're so easily deceived instead of like taking the step back and, and, and asking uh, the Holy Spirit, is this what I'm really seeing or is this a counterfeit? Is this, is this a mirage? Is this fake? Am I being deceived? Like that's why you have to um, always uh, well, just not jump into something yeah. and uh, so that you're not deceived, you want to always ask the Holy Spirit, is this what I'm seeing? Is this what I'm, what I'm feeling? Is this what you would have me see? Is this what you have me feel instead of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because sometimes we're so desperate for something like, I was thinking about that mirage, like if you were in a desert and you're so thirsty and you think you see water, right, right. it's really not sand. Water, something else. Ah. So, you know, uh, that was, I don't know, that's when he said mirage, that's what this into my yeah. mind because we could be so desperate so for something that we want to hear something like we think we hear right the holy right. spirit we mm -hmm. think we, mm -hmm. we see our next husband we think we see okay we're supposed to uh move there or we think we see okay this is supposed to be my job but it's really not yeah yeah so, yeah and thank you for that for right and so solomon said 
uh, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. And so if God's brought you to a house with a leader that you know is a man or a woman of God, you can always sort out those variables that if you're not sure and you're hearing some things, you want to safeguard your heart. So you'll come and you'll talk with that trusted person that you know is a praying person that's aligned with heaven and can give you input as to yes, no, maybe wait. Let's, let's fast. Let's look for what God is going to, because if, Oftentimes, because we do, we're moved by our own emotions and our own impulses because of what, what our own desires, come on now, our fleshy desires want what it wants. So it bypasses that safeguard and we get into trouble. But don't be blaming God because you could have come and done it the right way, but you chose to do it on your own. And oftentimes we learn through those hard lessons and that's where we find the shame. And we have to humble ourselves back to God. So thank you for that. So real quick, again, I just want to um, finish off uh, 1 Timothy 4.1 with some terms that we're going to look at. Uh, those of you, I've emailed them to you. On, on Wednesday, I will use the PowerPoint. Uh, we're going to look at speak, speak of expressively. We're going to look at latter times. We're going to look at depart, faith, and seducing spirits. We are going to get a lesson in a little bit of Greek terms. I think that it is important when we study the word of God, we need to examine it closely at its natural language and then begin to take those terms and really see what was the author trying to tell us. And in this case, it was the apostle Paul who was filled with the Holy Spirit of God. He was trained and equipped by the Holy Spirit of God. This was a man who used to be in the wrong, all of a sudden had an encounter, and it was the Holy Spirit who taught him. And the Holy Spirit inspired him, and he was the spiritual father of young Timothy, a pastor who was now a pastor of a church. And so Apostle Paul was teaching and imparting into his pupil, okay, was imparting into his spiritual child and telling him something that was happening and how does that translate to us today we're going to look at that closely on wednesday we're going to really debunk some things we're going to examine and we're going to take hold the truth and we're going to have these nuggets really empower us to examine our own life because as i said before we want to yes we want to test and we want to examine and we want to know but it first starts with examining our own hearts it first starts here at home whenever we get prepared with the word of god to teach let us make sure that we are allowing that word to teach us first because the word of god is a double-edged sword and just as it cuts going in it cuts coming out so it's got to cut us first it's got we got to practice on ourselves first come on now can i hear someone say an amen, amen. so we want to practice the word on our life we'll be the guinea pigs right ah let us be the, the vessel of, of, of being able to examine our hearts. We're going to use the word of God to see where exactly are we standing at. We're going to learn some terms on uh, Wednesday. And so did somebody receive something today? Amen. Amen. So y'all ain't going empty handed. Yes. All right. Well, we give God the honor and the glory and the praise for that.